If you're like me, you see a lot of asthma patients in clinic, and chances are you've encountered a misdiagnosis or two. It's not all that surprising. Asthma is a common diagnosis with nonspecific symptoms. But with new and advanced and expensive therapies hitting the market, it's becoming more crucial now than ever to be able to confirm a diagnosis of asthma. After watching this video, you'll be much more confident in your ability to not only recognize, but confirm a diagnosis of asthma. So, what do you actually need to confirm a diagnosis of asthma? Well, you need two things. First, compatible respiratory symptoms. These can include things like cough, wheeze, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. And know that these symptoms oftentimes vary over time in intensity and can lead to an exacerbation in its most severe form. And now what makes this constellation of symptoms more suggestive of asthma, as opposed to other respiratory diseases, is the fact that they occur following exposure to a trigger. Triggers may include exposure to cold air, allergens, exercise, or respiratory viral infections. But these symptoms alone are not quite yet enough to confirm your diagnosis. You also need variable airflow obstruction. Now you might ask, what exactly is variable airflow obstruction? Obstruction is determined by the use of spirometry. It's defined as an FEV1 over FEC less than 70 or below the lower limit of normal. Now, what differentiates asthma from other obstructive lung diseases is the fact that it is variable or reversible. Now, I know these two terms sound very similar, but there are some subtle differences. Variability refers to the fluctuation in lung function over time, such that you might see that a patient has normal spirometry on one occasion and abnormal or obstructive spirometry on another. The other is reversibility. This is a key differentiator of asthma as well. It's defined as an FEV1 that improves by 12% and 200 milliliters after the use of albuterol. So there you have it. You have your first way of confirming a diagnosis of asthma in the presence of compatible respiratory symptoms with variable or reversible obstruction. There's your diagnosis. Another method to confirm variable obstruction is through the use of peak expiratory flow monitoring. It's simple, convenient, and can be used in the home setting. Here's an example of one such device. You'll find values on the left ranging from zero up to about 800 that correspond to liters per minute. A patient's peak expiratory flow can be predicted by using certain online calculators that will take into consideration the age, height, and gender. Now, you'll instruct them to take the lever down into the neutral or zero position. You'll want to inhale maximally and then forcefully exhale to completion, like this. You'll have your patient record three of these values, both morning and evening. Over about a one week period of time, if these values vary by more than 20%, it's consistent with variability of obstruction or asthma. But there are certain downsides to using this method. In fact, it's considered less reliable than spirometry. Spirometry will require that the patient travel to the clinic or pulmonary function laboratory, where more information is gathered, most notably a flow volume loop. Now, let's take a look. So now, here you find me actually inside a flow volume loop that was obtained during spirometry testing. Here's a classic first limb of the loop. In expiration, you can actually see there's a scooping nature to this flow volume loop. Now you can confirm that obstruction truly exists by again confirming that the FEV1 over FEC is less than 70. Now, after albuterol, a bronchodilator is given, you can see that things open up much more. In fact, there's room to breathe, so to speak. This is a normal flow volume loop. There's absolutely no scooping to this. This is considered reversible airflow obstruction and is diagnostic of asthma in the presence of compatible respiratory symptoms. So now you might be thinking, but what about those patients that have normal spirometry, but you still think they have asthma because they have symptoms that are suggestive of it? 
Well, this is where you'd use bronchoprovocation challenge testing. Most commonly, we use the methylcholine challenge test. Methylcholine is a substance that directly stimulates airway smooth muscle cells and actually causes bronchoconstriction or airway lumen narrowing. Methylcholine challenge testing is performed in a pulmonary function laboratory by a trained respiratory therapist. Now, after obtaining a baseline FEV1 value, methylcholine is administered in escalating doses until either the FEV1 drops by 20% or the maximal dose is achieved. So now let's take a look at the graphical representation of a methylcholine challenge test. On the x-axis, you find the doses of methylcholine challenge, whereas on the y is your present predicted FEV1. The value of 100% corresponds to your baseline FEV1 measurement. Now these values are plotted after each dose of methylcholine, such that you'll find a curve that progressively drops to the point where it crosses that 80% mark. This is an important value. This is considered your PC20, or the provocation challenge dose that causes a 20% fall in your FEV1. If this value is less than 8 to 16 milligrams per milliliter, this is positive and consistent with bronchial hyperreactivity. Before you order this test, however, there's a few things you need to know. Some medications can actually interfere with the interpretation of the results. Medications like short-acting beta agonist, long-acting beta agonist, and anticholinergics can actually falsely make this test normal. For a list of all these medications, including the time to withhold, can be found on the ATS website in their methylcholine challenge guidelines. In addition, there are certain instances where you would not want to perform this test. These include a patient who has an FEV1 less than 50 to 60 percent, a recent MI or stroke within the last three months, a known aortic aneurysm, or a systolic blood pressure greater than 200, or a diastolic pressure greater than 100. Now what have we learned today? We know that asthma requires the presence of compatible respiratory symptoms that often require a trigger. In addition, it requires the presence of variable or reversible airflow obstruction. This can be determined by two predominant methods, through the use of spirometry or peak expiratory flow monitoring. In the event that either of these tests are normal and you still suspect asthma, this is when you'd use a methylcholine challenge test. Stay tuned to our next video to learn how to use inflammatory phenotyping in asthma.